Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 one five five two to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasha. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. The Burrito Brothers celebrate an illustrious past while serving up fresh contributions for a bright future. They continue to climb the branches of the many tall pines first planted in 1968, trace the winding paths of country and rock and roll back, and you'll find them there. Anyone who had a heart and ears can tell these guys are world-class musicians and songwriters with one listen. Here they are in the years carrying on the tradition of classic late 1960s and 70s, hippie country country rock music expanding its boundaries, always exploring new horizons. Country rock's big bang came in Los Angeles in the late 60s. In 1968, Ian Dunlop and Barry Tashin started the Flying Burrito Brothers. Then in 1969, with Graham Parsons and Chris Homan at the helm, the group released their classic first LP, The Gilded Palace of Sin. Since then, the band has carried on, always evolving. This year marks the 50th anniversary of that classic LP. Graham Parsons' original vision for the band is still going strong. I just ran 20 red lights in his honor, says Chris James. At the beginning of the 1980s, the band moved their base of operations from L.A. to Nashville. At that point, the name was shortened to the Burrito Brothers. The band has remained in Nashville ever since. Now the Burrito Brothers are right on track. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. It's a new life. For we, mmm, feeling good, says Chris. The band features Chris James, who's been involved with the band since 2009. Guitarist Bob Hatter. Tony Paoletta on uh, pedal steel and drummer Peter Young. All extremely talented musicians who love being involved with the band's legacy and creating new music to keep their legacy alive. They continue to carry the torch via the Notorious Burrito Brothers release, which features the band's trademark, tight ensemble playing, beautiful harmonies, and excellent songwriting. The new album features eight original songs and the band's version of The Dark End of the Street from Gilded Palace of Sin. Will James from Graham Parsons International says the latest incarnation is the closest to the original FBB sound of all of the previous bands. Graham Parsons said it best. The ideal keeps going on. It's not like it's dead or anything. Whether I do it or anybody else does it, it's got to keep going. Please welcome frontman for the Burrito Brothers, Chris James, to Interviewing the Legends. Hello, Chris. Hello, thank you for having me. Appreciate it very much, Ray. It's an honor and a treat to get to do this. Well, where are you originally uh, born and raised? I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Okay. Uh, spent my uh, childhood and uh, and went to Kansas State University after high school, and then uh, after that, I had moved to Nashville to pursue a career in music. Well, when did you move to Nashville? Uh, 1980. Okay. Yeah. That's where all the great musicians are, and they still are, you know? Well, yeah, you could make a case for that, yeah. and certainly uh, the studios, too. It seems to really have the uh, corner on the great studios in the, of the world. 
I, some of my uh, one of my favorite football players of all time is from Kansas, uh, John Riggins. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was I was thinking you might say Barry Sanders. He was from well, Barry, Barry, Barry Sanders too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, yeah, Kansas is a great place, and of course, one of my favorite progressive rock bands, Kansas, from Kansas. <laughs> oh yeah, which seemed unusual to me when they came out because they they seemed so. Um, Prague, almost right. like the European groups and stuff, you know. The, the, the reputation of Kansas seems more rural, and in fact, uh, a lot of that uh, sort of country rock, I guess they called it back then, uh, the, the rock groups, the hippie groups that uh, utilized country sounds and flavors in their music, like the Flying Burrito Brothers and New Riders of the Purple Sage right. and... Uh, Pure Prairie, Poco, those yep. kind of groups uh, were very popular there in the Midwest. Kansas seemed an anomaly, kind of. It's like, wow, so they sound like that, huh? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it, but but a lot of the guys did look like they were from Kansas. <laughs> well, yeah, they looked like it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. They it, just didn't really sound like no, it. No, not at all. They blew me away because these guys were so good as far as musicianship, you know? Oh, yeah. They're incredible. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, the Burrito Brothers are back. Uh, the, the long history of the band, of course, some great players, Graham Parsons, uh, Chris Hillman, um, Michael Clark, Bernie Leadon, and I've had Rick Roberts on the show. Uh, oh, he's a sweet guy. I like Rick a lot. He's a yeah. good guy. He really is. I, I loved him yeah. in Firefall, especially. Yeah, uh, yeah. Great yeah. Group. Michael Clark was in that, too. Yep, that's right. Yeah. How, how did the uh, how did the concept of reincarnation of the Burrito Brothers begin? How did that all begin? I'm not sure. It's it's such a strange history for a group, but more than almost any you could find, it's just this endless revolving door mm -hmm. of uh, people coming and new people coming in. Uh, there's an amazing fact that uh, no two albums in a row by the Flying Burrito Brothers who moved into and just the Burrito Brothers. No two albums in a row have the same personnel. There's always somebody right. who left and a new guy coming in. At first, um, you know, the story of Grant Parsons is pretty famous now, and he, he was uh, irresponsible, I guess you could say, uh, uh, kind of difficult uh, for Hillman, who was more of the band leader right. at the time, I believe. Uh, they finally kicked Graham out for yeah. not showing for gigs or being too loaded or whatever, even though he stands as the single most uh, important figure in the history of the group. It was his vision more than anybody's uh, at the start. But he's only on the first two albums. Exactly. Yeah. And he goes solo. Yeah. Uh, that's when Rick Roberts came in. Uh, Hillman got lured away by Stephen Stills to be in the NAS, and it just goes on and on. Um, at one point in 1972, when Hillman was deciding to leave, uh, they regarded it as possibly the end, which lots of groups have, have made so-called final albums only to come back later. Um, the fourth Burrito Brothers album is called The Last of the Red Hot Burritos. Right. And uh, lo and behold, the next year, Rick Roberts is uh, requested to lead a version of the band overseas to do concerts, and they recorded an album, a live album. So the group is once again going, and that's really the pattern, is that there's always been a promoter or a label deal or something mm -hmm. that asks the most viable members of, of the last version of the group to reconstitute it with one or two new guys and keep going. And here's an interesting fact. Graham Parsons was asked the year he died in 1973 right. what he thought of the Burrito Brothers, well, the Flying Burrito Brothers back then, um, carrying on without a single original member, without a single guy from the first album in the group. That was just three, four years later. And uh, uh, his answer was surprisingly upbeat. He said, what you just mentioned, that the group uh, got to keep going, whether I do it or anybody else. Yeah. Got to keep the 
and, and we're true to that. It's every single change has been a rollover with an invite from a label deal or a promoter. The band sounds so fresh. It sounds like yeah. you, you guys came out of nowhere and are very, very new. You know, it, it, it. I love it. You guys are great musicians. You really are. I agree with that. I think these three guys I'm working with are virtuosos. They're just yep. sensational players, and they do sessions all the time. Right. They demand right. the seasoned pros. What? What is it? Is it true that you asked Chris Hillman to be in the band and, and maybe yeah. take the lead? Before I answer that, I, I thought I might address, you said it sounds, seems like the band came out of nowhere, and I think a lot of the uh, public kind of has that impression, mm -hmm. because as, you, as I put it, it, the group really kind of fell under the radar, but it, if you look at the timeline on our website, it never didn't exist. Right. And there were always albums, they just weren't as big as this one. This is yep. the biggest record deal the group's had in decades. Yeah. It's a worldwide distribution. A label in England called SFM, uh -huh. and they're promoting us and arranging things like you and I are doing right now. And it's it's a higher level than I've witnessed in the group. Uh, so uh, uh, it, it it isn't out of nowhere, but it kind of seems like it. Yeah, yeah. I but mean, back to Hillman. Yep. When when I came into the group in 2009, I had to. Uh, just like everybody who's new to the group, really, I have been around. I, I have uh, substituted for Carlton Moody on a few occasions in that Burrito Deluxe lineup and uh, had played a, a guest vocal on an album. And I was on, first album I was on was in the 1980s. Seven. It was called Wheels, and it was a Graham Parsons tribute that was recorded. Uh, Aga Bell, a friend of mine here in Nashville, organized a tribute for the essentially unknown Graham Parsons still at that time. And, uh, and the Burrito Brothers, who were just two guys mm -hmm. with a Nashville record deal, right. uh, Gip Gilbo and John Beelan, yep. used the backup band at that night. Argyle organized a backup group for all the individual singers and stuff. And they ended up recording it, and it came out as an album called Wheels. And so I had, in in that, I had my first entry of being on an album mm -hmm. uh, with the Flying Burrito, with the Burrito. It was the burrito one flying, those were the Burrito. Yeah. They, the name dro they dropped the name Flying in 1980. Right. It kind of popped up here and there over the years, but it's essentially dropped in 1980. So uh, by 2009, my turn came, <laughs> and strangely enough, the group was in sort of who's there was no clear cut leader. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlton Moody had been a previous leader, and, and the reason for the reconstitution this time was that he had had enough and bowed out. He was over in Paris, France. Uh, and uh, it was getting complicated or whatever. I can't speak for him, but right. he, he reached in for his run. And uh, and a label in England, STV Records, that had Bill Taylor talked to me about uh, realizing that I uh, had been around the guys and knew, knew them, asked if I might be able to... Uh, that organize the next version of the Burrito Brothers. He wanted them on his label, and he knew that the other group had just hit, hit a wall or whatever it was. And uh, so the idea there and then was to contact Chris Hilden and see mm -hmm. if he was interested. 
Yep. Because if the Burrito Brothers are starting back up, uh, he's the main guy still alive. In fact, even then, he was the only surviving member of the the classic Gilda Palace of Sin lineup. Right. And uh, and we were we were even going so far as to see if we could talk to. Well, we did talk to Rick Roberts, mm-hmm. Bernie Ledden, Al Perkins, because yep. he, he was deceased. Yep. Uh, Michael Clark was deceased, so the closest we could get to the the pedigree that goes all the way back was Gene Parsons. Mm-hmm. And, um, and this idea of getting the most veteran, still alive version of the Burrito Brothers possible, and it, it was an almost, because all of them said that they would do it, if Hillman did, mm-hmm. and, and uh, clearly, for obvious reasons, Hillman would be the leader. He was the the co-creator in the first place, right? And, and uh, um, he responded that he was happy with his career the way it was. It was easier. He made good enough money. I think he was mostly doing just duets with Herb Peterson and uh, right. easy, no overhead kind of touring and um, and the way he put it, he said, if I wanted to go back and rekindle past glories, it would be the birds with David <laughs> Crosby and Roger McQueen. He said that they get offered crazy money to, yeah. to do that and they, and they don't because they don't really need to and they're all comfortable and he said that the flying brothers never really were any sort of big cash in gold mine and uh, uh, kind of had memories, you know, the whole thing was dealing with Graham and such, but uh, it was kind of a headache. So he said no, he declined. And upon doing that, the others who all said they'd do it if he did it also declined. Right. Del Taylor for STV Records was not deterred. He, he came back saying, that's okay. There's been new lineups and, uh, uh, you know, reinventions of the breeders all through the years. So he kind of set up a formula. He said uh, that he wanted me to, to tell him each of the people I was going to, uh, talk to different people about being in the group and uh, who seemed appropriate. They needed to have some sort of history in their family tree, so to speak. Sure. And he wanted to recognize, he wanted to okay each entry, which is kind of different, the shopping list. He also required that I uh, obtain trademark or U.S. trademark rights to the name. Okay. Which I had never done that before, but it was available, it was open. How about and, uh, and we were the guys, you know, we could show usage. And uh, and then, of course, you know, if the album wasn't good, he could still decline it. But right. we met all three of those points. And uh, at that time, it was, uh, at first, it was Walter Egan, who had already, he's carryover from before, right. and Rick Lano, who was the carryover before. And then I was the new member who had been around and guested before, but this was the first time I was actually, you know, in the band picture, a, a true full member. And we got um, Soup Granda, who had been, he was from the Ozark Mountain Daredevil. Oh, yeah, sure. Great band. Great band. Yeah. And he agreed to do it, and then Ozark got back together. <laughs> And and uh, he hadn't bailed out on. And then we got Michael Curtis, and uh, something happened. With, I think it was him deciding that he didn't think he could be dedicated enough time to it because of the, his daughter, who was just uh, the age that he wanted to to focus on. And uh, and so we kind of kept. It was Rick and Walter and I were kind of thinking, well, we're still stymied to sign the fourth guy, and that. Uh, Ended up getting my brother Fred, yep. who had been the contact in the first place, mm-hmm. uh, for the label. He, right. He's a known producer of yep. blues records, and uh, that's the the label had had reached me through Fred. Fred saying that his brother Chris knew these people, we ought to talk to him. I, I just want to mention one thing to the audience: your brother has had five Grammy Award nominations. 
for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's an really yeah. established and serious talent. It's all in the, the blues field. It's yep. kind of a little different from from us, which proved to be his reason for exiting, that it just kind of wasn't right. totally his deal. But it worked for us because after a couple guys being in and right back out, uh, we were kind of eager to get something going. And it was Walter who suggested since that label head already knows Fred, he'd probably okay him. Sure. And so that happened. And you, you know, the, the way it is right now, you you know, every album you can bring in guest artists, you know, because they would love to yeah. do it because of the name, you know. Well, we did on this one. Yeah. Uh, Ronnie Gilbo sings lead on uh, Do Right Man. Right. He's a co-writer on mm-hmm. it. It's nice. It's a, He's a great singer and a great talent. <clears throat> in fact, I asked him to join back then at the at very beginning. I always thought he was perfect for this group. But he had a, a, a some sort of health care. I, I, I don't think calling him a nurse is exactly right, but uh-huh. in some sort of job that has lots of like stability and benefits. And so he doesn't go to her. He doesn't really want to be in a band right. like that. But he, uh, he does lots of sessions and uh, uh, performs locally. And uh, I've always thought his talent was ideal for this group, mm-hmm. so I approached him when I was first looking for people. Well, the the, the latest album, the Notorious Burrito Brothers, is excellent. I gave it five stars. Uh, I, you know, I I love bands like uh, I like the Eagles, and I've I've had uh, Don Felder on the show recently. Uh, but I, I like more the rock type. You know, uh-huh. Eagles. Yeah. When they get too twangy, that's when they lo- I lose a little interest. But but this is great. I mean, you know, I love bands like Pure Prairie League and Firefall and Poco. You know, those are different. You know, I think I think uh, I regard, especially now, uh-huh. uh, the Burrito Brothers as a rock group. We're, we're a rock group that incorporates uh, that incorporates uh, some of the flavorings that right. touches the aesthetic of. Uh, think so. Yeah, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make people think of something like us anymore. Right. It makes them think more like Southern Rock or Boogian or something. Right. It's, it's not really the right term for us. I think we're just a rock band. Well, the band, like for instance, Bring It, which is one of my favorite tunes on the album. Yeah. Uh, that thing, if this was in the 70s, that could have been easily a top 40 hit. There's, there's, I uh, think so. Yeah, yeah that, was, that, was, that was part of the thought. We, we really did conceive this uh-huh. album. We didn't just wind up with nine songs and say, okay, that's enough, let's call it an album. We, we had a, a whole idea, a, a concept for, for mapping it out and right. uh, bring it as the introduction. It, it asks everybody to come on in and join the party. And, yeah. uh, and it's really initially when we first started writing the idea, it was thinking it would be, uh, live show opener, which I'm sure it still will be when we ever get around to, back <laughs> yeah, to that. I know. But it's, an, it's, the, it's this show opener, and uh, so it's high, higher energy, and, and of course I asked Bob when we first talked about the idea to come up with a, a killer guitar riff to it, you mm-hmm. know, and, uh, uh, and he did. Yeah, you know, it's kind of Tom Petty-ish in, in a way, the riff. <laughs> Moby Great Guy. Yeah. 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 Another great band. Oh, I love them. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, you got uh, Sometimes You Just Can't Win. Uh, talk about that, too. Yeah, that's a, that's of interest because it's a, it's a lyric that uh, is partly Graham Parsons. It comes from the Graham Parsons notebook. Right. There was an album in, 
the year 2000 that I was involved with making here in Nashville called the Grand Parsons Notebook. And what it is is John Nuis, Graham's friend from all the way back, from, he was in the International Submarine Band. Uh, he had a notebook of Graham's that had a bunch of lyrics and song ideas and phrases and things in it. And, uh, and a guy named Mike Ward here in Nashville got a record deal for the idea of getting famous and somewhat famous like me <laughs> um, <laughs> guys to to uh, build an album from it, you know, writers and singers and right. great musicians. And, uh, uh, and I got one song on there and then uh, um, had these other ideas. I had photocopies of these lyrics from Grant mm -hmm. and uh, and so we think now it's ideal to include a, a quote unquote new Graham Parsons song. Yeah. We found out that um, that actually was a little more a lyric of Fred Neils, the famous folk singer who uh, who did everybody's talking and the dolphins and stuff. And Graham had Apparently, just written it in his book from memory. Nowhere did he write Fred Neal's name, and nowhere did he write a song title. He just wrote some words down. And when I went to compare, I realized that he took liberties and uh, came up with some sentences of his own. And so we decided to credit it to Graham Parsons and Fred Neal on the lyrics. And then the group, uh, as we came up with the uh, the music, and the idea there was to to emulate the classic era of the Rolling Stones because Graham Parsons was so famously yeah. influenced by and influenced the Rolling Stones and friends with Keith Richards. And so instead of taking this Graham lyric and, uh, and treating it with some sort of old school country, we decided to rock it out. Yeah, I love how you guys did that, you know. Uh, same thing with um, Wheels of Fire. I mean, all, all the uh, the people you mentioned in that in that song is incredible. I don't know. Yeah. It must have taken you a long time to put that one together. <laughs> yeah, although it's funny how they sort of just start falling in, you know. <laughs> We're just so into the process and loving every moment of it. But everybody in this band is on the same page and has mutual love and respect for each other so it just goes pretty nicely we uh that is definitely the finale incredible it's uh it has references of Everybody. each of the songs <laughs> that came before it and then yeah. it's all these all these inside references to things that happen in the history of rock it's fantastic it thank really you <laughs> thank you that's what i that's what i was open <laughs> yeah I got to tell the audience, the song's title is a classic LP by Cream. Uh, there's reference yeah. in there from the birds. Uh, there's there's a, uh, a comment that came from Johnny Depp, couldn't give a rat's ass. Yeah. <laughs> there, 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 <laughs> there's some Beatles references, Mother Mary. Uh, yeah. One of my favorite albums of all time, <laughs> Wings of Fire from the Mahavishnu Orchestra. You mentioned that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's incredible. Yeah, it's a, the flight variation. I mean, the album is yeah. called Birds of Fire, right? But, uh, yeah, Birds uh, of Fire, that's right. Point, I, I said, we, yeah. Wings of Fire, I was certainly thinking that. Yeah, I just had Jan Hammer on the on the show, too. So I should oh, know that. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. But what a, what a, to incorporate all these, you know, uh, lyrics in there and, and sayings and, you know, like you said, pieces of history from rock and roll. Uh, it's, and, and, and for it to, you know, come up with a song out of it. That's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. It seemed like everything flowed. I, I really believe it's the best album I've ever been a part of, uh -huh. and it's the uh, strongest album uh, by the Burrito Brothers uh, yep. in my tenure, and probably for a ways back, uh, like, because like we said, the, the group kind of fell under the radar some years yep. there, and, and, uh, and I don't think there was the same level of uh, input. Uh, we really finally arrived at a, at a chemistry and a, a camaraderie that is just sweet as it could be. We are brothers. Yeah. Well, you guys are going to take it to another level. I got a feeling, and 
I just w- hope you guys stick together so we won't have another incarnation. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was hoping that too. I'm thinking that it's possible that this may be the first time in the entire 51 year history that <laughs> the two albums in a row are made by the same lineup. How about that? I sure hope so because this one is just is really splendid in my book. And What's it dynamite? Feels so right. Uh, and, and we already are working on, uh, on new ideas. Awesome. I mean, we don't just, uh, just stop and wait and see yep. what's going on with this. We, we just keep, keep doing what we do. The, uh, album was done back in November, early November. And, uh, uh, our friend and representative in England, Bob Boiling, uh, got us the deal before we even had finished recording it because the label, that he spoke to, uh, Diane Adams at, uh, SFM in England, uh, really liked our last album that we self-produced, which I now realize was a mistake. We thought we could, uh, market it ourselves, sell it online, right. and, uh, sell it at our gigs and stuff, and, and when it didn't do much, we, uh, we tried to pitch it, and unfortunately, since it was already available on on downloads and listed on Amazon that way and had a, uh, you know, the code, the UPC code and all that. Even, uh, we gave, gave it a, a label name, even though, you know, anybody could do that and it self-produced them. But this label said, sorry, uh, that still counts as being released. You just let us know when you got your next thing because, you know, mm. we like. So that worked like a charm. Yeah. So we, we finished the album in November and had a deal, bingo, just like that. That's and, amazing. And uh, here, the yeah. release date was a couple weeks ago, yeah. a few weeks ago, something like that. Yeah. So, so that's almost five months. We Sometime around the first of the year or end of last year, we started already talking about getting together, writing new material, coming up with ideas. And, and even though we're stalled from getting together personally, we're able to communicate, sure. you know. The, the, we we uh, exchange MP3 sketches. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, we talk about it. We email yep. each other. We phone call, you know. So uh, we're actually, in fact, I just sent Tony Perrella a, a a new song idea that I came up with called Together. Mm-hmm. And the next day, this was just two days ago. The next day, he already sent it back to me with a wonderful steel part all over <laughs> it. And, cool. and Pete uh, put some drums. It, it's, uh, I, I think we'll be <laughs> raring to go when, when, uh, when this horrible pandemic ends. And hopefully we'll be doing some good concerts. Uh, the desire is to go overseas. Well, that's it. You know, you you may hit it huge, you know, in say Japan or or uh, in Amsterdam, and you never know. Well, that is the goal. That's the yeah. hope. Uh, uh, we don't know, but I think that it's more likely for something like that than to think we're going to somehow overtake the popularity contests of the United States. You know, right. it's a different scene nowadays. It, uh, it yeah. doesn't feel real uh, conducive to an older group like us and who we are, it's a, it's an odd sort of American Idol pop scene here. I, I think uh, overseas we stand some chances of uh, of being respected and regarded higher. It's I liken it somewhat, at least my hope, my, you know, how they say envision what you hope to happen is like the jazz guys, especially the black guys of the 50s and 60s, guys like Dexter Gordon who went over to, to Europe That's right. and, found, and found success and respect. Mm-hmm. And back here in the U.S., it was prejudice and, and ignoring them, you yeah. know. And I think that we have enough of a pedigree and, and are talented enough to be seen as a voice of something worth checking out, you know. I, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of Europeans really love this kind of music and don't quite know how to execute it. Mm-hmm. Well, like you said, they love that kind of music. Yeah. You know, they... they, they you, you were mentioning the R&B bands. A lot of those bands, too, went to Toronto 
you know. Yeah, that's were, a possibility too. I've, yeah. I've done a couple interviews with Canada, and they yeah. have a, a different sort of vibe. They do. Them. They do. Yeah, yeah. I want to mention a couple of more songs on the album because <clears throat> they're all worth mentioning. Um, Thank you. Love is a river, which is cool because it switches direction and kind of has a psychedelic feel at the end. <laughs> I like that. I, you know, that's, that's uh, certainly in our wheelhouse. I mean, I really like the idea of, of psychedelic touches being sure. part of the, of the equation well, with this group. The, the song told totally I think of it as a progressive rock group. Yeah. I think maybe that doesn't sure. immediately hit everybody because they sort of hear the right. country flavor. Right. But, uh, yeah, it's a mother of the river. It's very much. Yeah in that sort of mindset because it's an 11 minute suite yep. that uh, travels all over the place so uh, it's essentially built from four <clears throat> really two full songs and then two little fragments two song ideas all melded into one suite which is very much in keeping with the album being a, a flow a concept and uh, and uh God, I keep wanting to say progressive. That's a dangerous word. <laughs> <That's obvious. laughs> but, you know, the song kind of, it did fool me, you know, because it, it did switch direction. And I, I, the yeah. more I kept listening to it, I think, wow, man, this thing's really building up. <laughs> yeah. And then it finally comes back to uh, finish exactly. the whole cycle yep. with the uh, original melodic theme returning. Exactly. It's sweet, too. It kind of makes me think of... Um, Something like the way Ringo is always flashing the peace sign or the yeah. way the Beatles sing, all right. you need is love. You know, love is a river. It runs through everybody. It's a love that conquers all. It's very special. Very clever song. It really is. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to mention Dark End of the Street. Uh, something about Tony wanted to record the song. He felt the Brito version got too many things wrong. That well, that's actually true. It, uh -huh. it, uh, it might be blasphemy to some of the diehard uh, Van Parsons fans, and don't get me wrong, I think their version is pretty. I think it's very nice, right. mostly on the grounds of how talented those guys were and how wonderful a Graham Parsons singing voice. I just love his singing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is, though, he clearly, uh, kind of like that lyric I was talking about in his notebook, he would just do these things from memory. I think one of Graham's if not his biggest contribution to his peers and the world of rock in his day, was that he was so darn familiar with a whole bunch of traditional country songs right. and R&B. And that song is not written by the Burrito Brothers. It's, mm -hmm. it's an R&B standard. It was by James Carr. It was also recorded by Aretha Franklin. Mm -hmm. And Percy Sledge did it. The list goes on and on. Yep. And Tony had, just a night or two before uh, we talked, seen Dan Penn, who's one of the writers of that song with uh, Chips Moman. Uh, Dan Penn sang it, and Tony was taken by the fact that the form is really different from what we got familiar with on the Gilded Palace of Sin. It was more of a storyline that Graham didn't sing all of. He left out some parts and uh, some of the form is kind mm -hmm. of different. And uh, and he, Tony was saying that he thought it would be nice for us to do it in more of the true way it was written. Right. And at first I was against the idea because I still thought it came a little too close to just us copying something that the classic group did. We're, we're not into it. I mean, we'll do that in a live performance at the uh, proper salute to sure. where we, you know, if you're going to be in a burrito, but you got to do some of those songs. Uh -huh. You just want to play live. Of but putting it on an album, I don't know about that. And, uh, and he really wanted to and convinced us. And I thought, well, tell me such a special person. He brings so much to this group mm -hmm. that uh, I don't want to go against his wishes. I don't want to be that kind of tough guy or something. And so we did it. And man, I've grown to love it. I, I'm absolutely satisfied that it is absolutely not a copy right. of the version. I agree. Great, great, great track. And the, yeah. I, I want to. Is it is it acrostic? Is that how you pronounce that? 
man time is a healer or is it a stealer yeah <laughs> i love yeah. that <laughs> yeah, yeah it's funny it's great another train is gonna come we got a video of that uh it's on our website i uh, uh -huh. hope we do a little more of that uh, even though we can't get together um the guy who did the album artwork right and who also did all the layout and design when i was involved with the magazine in Nashville called Shake. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Warren Ells, and he surprised me one day. He just sent it to me. It blew me away. He sent a conceptual video of, uh, well, I guess you call it found footage or, or file footage, stuff he, he, he had access to, and uh, made a, a video of acrostics. So it's not us performing or uh, or on camera, but it's still, I think it works. Mm -hmm. I agree. That, the website is theburritobrothers.net, yep. and it's there. Also, another thing that's there is our performance last November mm -hmm. of the entire Gilded Palace of Sin from start to finish. Uh, it, we were asked to do that by Will James, who puts on a Graham Parsons tribute every year in Nashville, well, in a bunch of places. Right. He calls it Grand National, and uh, it was kind of ironic that we had just finished this album that's so special to us, so, you know, it's sort of the best album we've done in years, and yet there we are playing the 50-year-old songs, but, but I don't really have a problem with that on the grounds that it was an honor and flattering to be asked to do that, mm -hmm. and uh and we treated it in a, a different sort of way where we kept having alumni, previous members of the Burrito Brothers, yeah. come up and join us for various different songs. And we even did. Will, Will kept boasting and, and saying that he was sure nobody had ever done it. We did that final hippie boy, mm -hmm. that, that recitation that is on the very end of the album that uh, is in some sort of uh, uh, turned on 1969 variation of that uh, Hank Williams Luke the Drifter type character. Right. It was, uh, that took some memorization. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't about to, <laughs> to go out there knowing it was filmed and or just even knowing that it was being uh, attended and looked at. I wasn't going to read those words on a sheet of paper. I spent a lot of time learning that. <laughs> Well, the band is terrific. I mean, everything you did, uh, you know, your tributes w within the lyrics, um, all the songs are original except one cover tune, I believe. Uh, yeah. And that's the way it should be. You know, you, you this, oh, is, yeah. this is the next generation, you know. You want to have some fresh ideas and, you know, you want to come out with your own your own thing. You're, 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 you're not a cover band, you know. Oh, no, absolutely not. Oh, no. Cover bands don't continue to make no. new albums uh, uh, exactly. on a regular basis. Uh, yeah. you know, we've, we've got our own creativity that adds to the story. I feel like we're peaking. It feels really good. <laughs> you 
just got to get out on the road now, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although we're, we're really, uh, our priority is, is making great albums, right. or at least we'd like to believe they are. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there have been plenty of examples in music history of groups who were, uh, first and foremost, an album-making entity. True. Steely Dan certainly comes to mind. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe Alan Parsons Project, I don't yeah. know. But, uh, I wouldn't say we're quite only that, but absolutely not. I mean, I just told, I just mentioned how we played last November, and we were always interested and up for playing good shows. But on the other side of that coin, we're not like heavily desiring just hitting the road and staying out there. Right, right. Yeah, it's tough nowadays. The, 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 yeah. the road's not the same anymore, you know? Especially well, and we all are pretty okay in our careers. Uh, we always find the time and right. energy and heart and desire to give our uh, creativity to the breed of us, but it's not like the only thing these guys do. They're, like I said, they're, they're essentially full-time session guys. Yeah. They're, they're so good on their instruments. Yeah. They really are virtuosos. Tony Paoletta... Bob Hatter and Peter Young. Yeah. Well, you mentioned yeah. Steely Dan. That's exactly right. I mean, they didn't hit the road for a long time, and yeah. actually, they didn't know who who would be on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I better shut up right now because my first thought was that might almost be true of us. But yeah. Yeah, right now, it's not. But uh, but you look at the history of the Burrito Brothers, and uh, boy, is it ever ever changing. Yeah. It's not a bad thing, though, really. It's, it's the only group I know of that, that that seems to be the dynamic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there's groups. I, I don't think we really compare to the groups who have one old guy who <laughs> has been there all along and they still tour. Yeah. We're not exactly that. We're this reinvented. You're reinvented. Yeah. 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 What one band I can never understand, and here, here's where I get critical. I, I'm pretty much a purist, you know. I go way back with music, and you know, I take music very, very seriously. The Little River Band. I, I, I don't understand how they're still very, very, very popular without one original guy in the band, and they're playing. They're still playing the hits, you know, and that's what's yeah. getting the buy. But none of I these guys I get it because it, it has some parallel to what we were doing. I, there was a point in time where uh, each of the original guys, one at a time, I think, I mean, I'm not totally aware of their story, but I, I have some memory of reading an article about that. Where mm -hmm. they, they, they did sort of like the Flying Greater Brothers did, where guys left, and so, of course, you get the new guy because the band isn't folding up shop. Right. And then finally... Uh, Whoever the main lead singer guy was decided he'd had enough and he was or went solo, I think. And the band had all sorts of apparatus still going. They had a record deal, they had an agent booking them, and so they just folded over into uh, the guys who were still standing. But the strange part happens when some of those original guys, 10, 15 years later, decide. They object, they want back in, it's really their band. Right. And that's where it gets sticky because, uh, you know, for something like oh, well over a decade, they weren't in it. And uh, the group was was still carrying on as far as I know. I think they even made new albums. And, so that's a strange... That would be like Chris Hillman and Bernie Ledden wanting <laughs> to be in the Burrito <laughs> Brothers and us saying, no, you can't. Yeah. It would be a little odd, wouldn't it? Well, you know, the Little River Band, though, they were from Australia, the original guys. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, it just doesn't, I don't know, it just doesn't mesh well with me because they're, they're still selling out audiences. I, 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 I had seen them a couple of times without the original band. They, were, they just happened to be, they played with Kansas, they played with a lot of uh, the Firefall recently. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, I, they're not, I don't know, their original music doesn't stand out like yours does. You know what I mean? I, I listen to you guys, and I'm not thinking about the past. But these guys are still playing the hits. All again, Little River Band did have a lot yeah. of hits. You know? Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I it's, think we're kind of unique. In, you in guys are unique. Uh, yeah. 
fact that we're a part of a group that just keeps getting reinvented. I, I'd like to think that I've been a, a slightly stabilizing factor to it, where we might um, we might be able to uh, hold court here for a while. Uh, I don't ever want to uh, regard myself as all important. So, uh, I think that, uh, like a friend of mine, a music biz lawyer named Andy Harris, mm -hmm. said to me a couple years back, he said, Chris, there'll be a Brio Brothers long after you are dead and gone. <laughs> and I remember seeing a quote from Sneaky T where he said, there were about, in oh, 1979, I think it was, where they already kind of regarded it as having gone through a, a whirlwind of personnel changes and the, and his response was he believes there just will always be burrito brothers. Right. And it's, it's not without precedent. There's scripts like um, Sons of the Pioneers mm -hmm. or the Preservation Hall Jazz Band. There's some examples yeah. of a format that just carries on. And I'd like to think when my time is up that there's a younger guy who can take the helm and, and keep the ball rolling in much the same way that Grand Parsons said. Yeah. The idea has got to keep going, whether I do it or anybody else. Yeah, but you know what? You can change all that. All you got to do is come up with a big hit. <laughs> yeah, oh God, wasn't it? Yeah. Then they'll, 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 they'll only remember you guys. <laughs> the one that could have been, the one that got away was the Jagger Richards song, Wild Horses. Right. Because the Burrito Brothers did it first. The yeah. Flying Burrito Brothers uh, recorded and released Wild Horses on the second album. And uh, the agreement that, that I think mostly Mick Jagger, the businessman, mm -hmm. made was that we'll let you have it if you don't put it out as a single. And I think if they had been allowed to put it out as a single, it probably would have been a hit. And that would stand as the only one in the entire history, I believe, really. I believe you're right. Yeah. Well, that means you got to come out with something better now. <laughs> well, how about everybody start playing Bring It? There you go. I, I That's love the that song. song That's that a great song. Certainly, certainly yeah. has all the elements. It's only the times were so I know. bizarre and the, you know, the, the close mindedness of, of uh, kind of the powers that be, so to speak. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the right length, it's the right catchiness, it's the right. Uh, Yep. Uh, uh, who knows? You never know. Stranger things may have happened. Well, I'm gonna promote. <laughs> I'm gonna promote the hell out of it. How's that? <laughs> cool. cool. And, and the album. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it seems <laughs> the most likely candidate. I remember. Uh, you know, it's a it's a known sort of formula to put the uh, yep. the star song at the very first of an album. Yep. I remember Todd Rundgren talking about that. Yep. Uh, uh, so. Well, or if you get somebody else to record it for you, you know, and uh, just... Yeah, and then they want to hear the original, yeah. There you go. That'll work, yeah. too. That's a thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably not too far outside the wheelhouse of some of the country uh, mm -hmm. acts of today. Yep. I don't think... Yeah, I... No, I don't think so. Not yeah. at all. He, he, uh, he, now, they wouldn't be doing uh, Wheels of Fire or Acrostic or Love of the River, but mm -hmm. they might still bring it. Yeah. I think so. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know too many guys in the country business. I do know the um, Oak Ridge Boys. <laughs> well, that's kind of outside the, I know. Uh, <laughs> the realm we're, we're seeking right now, isn't it? I mean, they're a little bit on the uh, down side of a career. Yeah. And I don't really mean that as a, I don't mean that as a put down. I just mean that as Oh, they're getting older. I know Joe. Yeah, Joe, yeah. Joe Bonsall, he's a good guy. I've yeah, been on the show three times. He's a good guy. And one of the sons, uh, um, Golden, yep. was briefly in, he's in the history, in the, in the, in the wild convoluted, how many names can you possibly find who played with the slang or burrito brothers? Uh, there was a brief window where he was uh, around. That's right. I think it was in the early 90s, somewhere in there. Hmm. I did a uh, a conference call once with uh, Linda Ronstadt, Emmy Lou Harris, and Dolly Parton. <laughs> oh, wow. The trio. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they were, they were a hoot. You should have heard them on the phone laughing oh. and carrying on. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. Have you seen that? that? Fantastic documentary. 
documentary of uh, Linda, the Stewart and the Sound of My Voice. I haven't that seen was, that yet, no. Oh, my. Was it good? Oh, it's beyond good. It's, yeah. It's stellar. It, uh, I would have said that I always liked Linda Ratzak. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't follow her just religiously, so to speak. I had a, a few of her albums and always thought she was just a wonderful singer. I, I think the... Uh, Jimmy Webb tune that she recorded with Brian Wilson, mm -hmm. Adios, yeah. was a masterpiece. Yeah. And there's other examples, but I didn't realize the extent mm -hmm. of her mega stardom and creative uh, juices. You know, she she had that whole ability to record uh, the the Mexican, the Hispanic yep. albums, mm -hmm. the standards. The, uh, the rock years, the country years, uh, even um, classical type stuff. Uh, she had time on Broadway. She did everything. She got awards yeah. for it. Yeah. Her career is so impressive. Yeah. It's just mind-blowing. Yeah, I was fortunate. I saw her a long time ago in the early 70s with the Eagles, and then I saw her do the Mexican thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. The Mexican and show. And she's all. She, that's one of the most beautiful voices you, you could ever hear. Yeah. Wonderful voice, fantastic. Yeah. She, she could sing anything. Yes, yeah. yeah. And she wasn't yeah. bad looking either. <laughs> no, she got that right too. Yeah, yeah. I think she was clearly uh, uh, the most versatile one of those three. I mean, they're all just impressive talents. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, she's possibly the most versatile uh, singer. Oh yeah. I can after seeing that, I'm I'm thinking of anybody I've ever heard of. Yeah. Uh, this, this I agree. It's so sad that uh, I know that she can't do it. That she's <laughs> what is it, Parkinson's disease? Yeah, yeah. Um, she she uh, still had a lot of years left in her too. You know. Yeah, probably Shame. so. Although uh, she got a lot done. Yes, she did. Yeah. He, here's a band from the past. How about Freddie and the Screamers? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's my brother. <laughs> You were in yeah. the band too, weren't you? Well, I was never in the band, although I'm, I remember, uh, being asked to play keyboards on a couple things. I took, uh, a few dates, yeah. uh, a couple performances in Nashville, because I don't think, if I remember correctly, I don't think Freddie and the Screamers had a keyboard player. Well, you, you got credited. I, I saw your name in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the album. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a yeah. Brit British rock band, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there was Freddie and the Dreamers. That's right. That was in the uh, Mersey beat. Uh, yep. The British Invasion. British Invasion, yeah. Yeah. Freddie and the Screamers. He here's, a, uh, here's a question, Chris, I ask everybody, and I get some interesting answers. Uh, if you had a Field of Dreams wish, like the movie, uh, yeah. to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who would that be? And and they could be passed on. That's fine. Oh, my. Wow, I can't just immediately think of who that would be. I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I want to say uh, a Beatle. They seem to loom the highest. Although, I don't know. I, I should probably gear it toward who would offset what I do right. and not be somebody who would... Uh, completely take charge. Let's see, let's see. It would, I wonder if it would be at all possible to collaborate with Jimi Hendrix. There you go. That's a, that's a wild thought. It was yeah. something different for him. He, what a, what an absolutely brilliant musician he mm -hmm. was. Just imagine what he'd be doing now if he was still around, huh? Well, he certainly would be doing it. I, I, I yeah. can't hardly imagine except for the fact that when you're that great a musician, when you're that capable on an instrument, it's not likely to uh, to stop anywhere. You know, like sometimes uh, singers, you never know for sure if uh, their career would have carried on or if they would have sort of fallen into kind of sounding the same... Uh, uh, you just never know, you know. Like for instance, I've I've, thought, I've kind of wondered if Janis Joplin had lived, would, mm -hmm. would she have sustained a long career, or would it, it sort of almost works better just to be what we know of her? Yep. Uh, and uh, but I can't be sure. I don't know. But I do think that uh, uh, when you can play guitar like. Janis 
Jimmy Hendrix, there's going to be people that, you know, he would have branched into doing the album that was rumored with Miles Davis mm -hmm. or um, yeah. playing with, who knows, you know, an album with uh, David Gilmore, whatever, something. He would have been yeah. playing. He sure. would have been doing stuff. Maybe a little fusion like uh, John McLaughlin, you know? He might yeah. Be yeah. yeah, he might have gone there, there for a while. If yeah. he made an album with Miles Davis, it would have just opened the door to more of that, yeah. you know, to uh, uh, play with a couple of those kind of groups. Um, it, it's hard to say. It's, it's not too easy to picture him playing country, although I know he <laughs> you never uh, know. <laughs> was so uh, tuned in that he got it. I remember uh, reading that he was very impressed with Clarence White. Mm -hmm. I just think he's about it, the best musician I've ever heard. I, I, I think of, the, of Hendrix playing like um, nothing is hindering the heart to the fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, the, whatever the flow of the music is, he's able to just have it come come rolling right out. And uh, yeah. that's not really true for most musicians. Yeah. There is some limitation of... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, staying within the, the note choices and the things you're familiar with doing and all that. It seems to me like Hendrix comes as close as anybody I've ever heard to just executing everything that that flows through. Yeah, he was just getting started, too. Yeah, yeah. How weird. Only 47 years old. Yeah, it's amazing. He looks a lot older, too, when he yeah. last yeah. pictures, you know. He, yeah. he lived... I, I always thought that about George Harrison, you know, you think that uh, that guy on the cover of Abbey Road, the final Beatles, mm -hmm. you know, he's only 27 years old, and, yeah. and this is when he's already done everything we've ever heard yeah, about Beatles. Yeah, it's true, and he died young, you know. Yeah, and he looks <laughs> a lot older than that, I think true. he is, I think, you know, life experiences, he saw more right. than any 27 year old. Oh, definitely. He, <laughs> Definitely. <clears throat> Chris, anything else you'd like to promote or chat about? Uh, what's, what's next? So we got, you're working on some more music right now. Yeah, um, yeah I'm kind of, I even sort of have a tentative title. I'm not sure if we'll stick with it. But, okay. But we decided to uh, uh, toss out the idea of another suite. All right, good. It just felt like it, it works as a part of, now it's not at all uh sound wise or, or music wise a copy it just to do another sure. uh sweet and and, and uh, I came up with a uh, a piece of music uh that would be the main theme called history because I was thinking how how multifaceted that term could be mm -hmm. as the the hook as the lyric as the title because people who have lived together a long time married couples people who love each other family members they have history and then obviously this band is loaded with yep, history exactly and there's ways to to look at that word and that concept that are very poetic and cool and, and so I'm thinking we'll have a suite called history which the more I liked that and the more I thought of it might make a good album title too really good I like it I like it yeah, yeah so maybe a year from now or so. yeah. I hesitate to talk much about that because it, right now is the time for the notorious bird uh, bird burrito bird. <laughs> in fact did we not talk about that but the uh, title is an homage is a, a salute to the fact that the bird spits out is called the notorious bird bird right Right. And and so since that was right around the time of the beginning of the Flying Burrito Brothers and, and has been reported to be a variation on that name, in fact, mm -hmm. um, it salutes the foundation that we carry on, the, sure. the mentors, the guys who started it all. Yeah. It's very much in respect to them and, and to those who are aware of the history of the birds, they should recognize mm -hmm. this comparison. And, and so I thought for sometime now that at some point there ought to be a burritos album called The Notorious Burrito Brothers. Sure. Great title. I, I've had Roger McGuinn, uh, I've interviewed Roger. He's, he's a good guy. He lives in Orlando. Yeah, I've met him. Yeah. yeah. Nice guy. Bob's guitar is signed by him. He got, he bought 12 string. Uh, he, we, we 
we saw Roger McGlynn play a show mm-hmm. and Bob brought his guitar and asked him to sign it and he, he did. It was, it was sweet. He does a lot of like, um, uh, sea, seamen type songs now. Yeah, those sea shanties. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the folk dance stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. At one time, David Crosby was thinking about putting the birds together, and I told Roger about it. He says, "Let him do it. I'm not. I'm not in. <laughs> if he really? wants, if he I wants know. to do it, let him do it." <laughs> I was thinking that uh, the only way the birds are together it has to be the three surviving right. original members. It yeah. has to be Roger McQueen, Chris Hammond, and David Crosby. But uh, that window is looking like it's getting pretty oh, thin yeah. right now. It, I, it, it's probably unlikely. It's unlikely. I, he Roger's happy. He's doing what he's doing. Yeah, you know? yeah. I'm not sure. You know, as much as it sounds so good on paper, and, and you love those guys, and you uh, adore their history and having mm-hmm. the album, uh, I'm not sure that it exactly works as well as as people would like to think. You I know, know. they have been agree. down many roads, and they're pretty old now. Yeah. And it just might not flow so great. I don't but, think so. Uh, and it, Just like you guys, you know, the Burrito Brothers, you got a, a new uh, chapter and it's all fresh, all new, and uh, you guys are going to go far. You just got to get on the road a little bit. Yeah, know, and, yeah. Uh, Oh, I hope so. You yeah. know, I suppose it'll be a while. But I think things are looking up, you know? Things oh, are looking absolutely, up. Yeah. 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 This is the, this is the biggest upswing I've seen, yeah. I think, of playing it. If, uh, if we don't have some grand success from this it won't be for not trying exactly it's a it's a great album um, I, I love it like I said five stars uh, everybody needs to buy it and I'm going to promote the hell out of it uh, <laughs> thank you it'll be on you. YouTube iTunes uh, iHeartRadio we're, we're everywhere so you yeah. won't have to worry about any exposure uh, oh, excellent, excellent. And, <laughs> and uh, I want to invite people to check out our website, yep. burritobrothers.net. We'll put the links. And, and read the timeline, yep. read the blog that tells what's happening in each of the song lyrics. Uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, I like how you did that, by the way. That's Thank great. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, and it's a great website, by the way. Really good website. Cool. You know, you know, there's a lot of a lot of bands that forget about their websites, and then they're old, and they don't update it. <laughs> I hate when they well, do that. That's what we actually, I admit, just having done that until recently. You uh-huh. know, everything's on a new a new level right now. It's, it's great. Just back into gear a lot better. I, I think we let ours get a little old there uh, two, three years back. <laughs> it's all fresh now. Yeah. Well, it's strange to think that I've now been in it a long time. One, one guy, an interview I talked to a couple days ago, uh-huh. said it looked like my tenure in the group, if you go on um, Wikipedia, right. it lists all the members of 60 people or something. Yep. And it has a, a bar graph kind of timeline thing that shows the years each yep. of them were in. And I, I was kind of surprised and I guess gratified to notice that there's only three names in there that's been in this group more years than I. And when I mentioned that to this guy, he said, yeah, but not only that, I don't think any of them have been in uh, an 11-year period straight through. That's right. They, uh, they're they guys who were in for some years and out and back in. And You're going to be the longest lasting member. <laughs> yeah, it's starting to look that way. Where did that time go? I, I still thought I was kind of new. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> It's funny how things work out. Yeah, time flies. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much, man, for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Uh, when things clear, come to Florida, man. Everybody here will love you, love the band. 
Oh, thank you. I, I, I look forward to that. I hope so, and I sure do appreciate you having me. Anytime, man. You're welcome anytime on the show to promote anything you want. Excellent. Fantastic. All right, man. All right. Stay, it's been a, a real pleasure. Me too. Stay healthy. You too. Stay safe. Yep. All right. Take care. Right. Bye-bye. Yep. Purchase the Burrito Brothers' latest album entitled The Notorious Burrito Brothers at Amazon.com. I gave it five stars. You'll love the album. Uh, for more information about Chris James and the Burrito Brothers, visit the Burrito Brothers' website at www.theburritobrothers.net. Also, uh, they are on Facebook at www.facebook.com backslash Cosmic Nashville. And uh, let's see, you can also visit the Burrito Brothers at www.theburritobrothers.net backslash media. Very special thanks to John Lappin Enterprises for arranging this interview with Chris James and the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of Interviewing the Legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho, for the very latest interviews. It's real news. And don't forget to order my new book called The Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1. Chronicles Truths, Confessions, and Wisdom from the Music Legends that Set Us Free. Order yours today on hardcover or ebook at bookbaby.com or amazon.com. It features over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest rock legends on the planet. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by... The Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio. Station 1.